Hello everyone, my name is Karina. I go by Cardsy on social media and welcome back to the Scooby-Doo 60s AU series for Shaggy Part 2. In this series, I'm taking the iconic meddling kids from Scooby-Doo and bringing them to life with the help of a couple of my close friends. In the last video, I discussed the character who inspired Shaggy Rogers, the importance of his hair, and made his tunic. But today we'll be finishing up the costume by making his pants and having the character reveal. When looking at images of the costume, the first thing that came to mind when I was initially figuring out exactly what I was going to do for all the characters was corduroy for Shaggy. I wanted all my characters in the lineup to have different textures to their clothing, so it was best to translate the cartoon design into reality. I knew that the fabric was popular in the 70s, but I needed to make sure that it was also popular in the 60s. So while researching the fabric, I discovered that corduroy actually has a pretty extensive history. Now most of the information I'm sharing today comes from the article The Long and Bumpy Road of Corduroy. It actually pleasantly surprised me with the number of uh, citations I had from primary sources to back up its evidence behind the history of corduroy, which is why I feel so comfortable sharing a lot of the information from this article. I can't get into all the nitty gritty details about the fabric here, but the first examples of corduroy date back to ancient Egypt. The fabric that is the beginning stages of corduroy didn't really have the ribbing texture though. So it's actually something else called fusion, and I'll have the word right here. I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce this word, nor the word that is more likely linked to its origin. There's a lot of people who think that the word fusion actually comes from the city that's, which is called um, Fustat. I can't really pronounce it, but here's the word right here, which is a city near Cairo. The book Textile Fabrics, written in the 1870s, claims that fusion, of which we still have two forms, in velveteen and corduroy, was originally wove fustat on the Nile with a warp of linen thread and a woof of thick cotton so twilled and cut that it showed on one side a thick but low pile. There's a bit of a gray area to when the corduroy that we know today first started, and exactly who started it, to be honest. The company Brook Brothers claims that what we now recognize as corduroy emerged in the late 18th century in Manchester, England, as factory wear during the Industrial Revolution. So they claim that it started in the late 1700s. In the 1891 edition of the Transactions of the Philological Society, it states, corduroy is a trade word of English concoction introduced between 1776 and 1787 as the name of corded fustin. It is impossible to say whether it was named after the inventor, corduroy is an English surname, and corduroy is actually the earliest spelling of the fabric, or whether the inventor meant to simulate a French word. There's also a newspaper clipping from 1774 that mentions corduroy as being a export from Britain. So we know at least that it started somewhere in the late 1700s. How corduroy got its name is actually up for debate. There's a lot of different points and arguments that has to do with language. However, I don't want to focus on that today, and instead I want to focus more on how the textile is used by people, as in who wore it and why and how it influences what I'm talking about today with the 1960s. Corduroy has often been associated with the working class, as it's a cotton fabric that's easy to maintain. Corduroy has an association with military uniforms. In fact, in this Macy's article from their 1911 catalog, it advertises the textile being used in hunting suits. If you notice, they even have some images of corduroy hats, which personally for me, as a little hat fanatic, I find that very interesting. So by the time we reach the 1960s, corduroy has actually decreased in popularity, but it's about to spike back up in popularity because of the Beatles. There's a lot of looks that the Beatles popularized, um, one of them being the colorless suit. But what I want to focus on actually is how they popularized corduroy. As soon as they started wearing the corduroy fabric, like they would wear it in hats, they wear it in suits, they wear it in pants, it started going up back in popularity with the counterculture youth. And as that continues on into the 70s, we reach this pinnacle moment in time where we quite possibly see the most corduroy ever with it being everywhere. Since we established in the last video that Shaggy's hair points to him being in the counterculture movement, I thought that the fabric would be perfect for his character as it also is a sign of the counterculture. So the color of Shaggy's pants is something that actually tripped me up at one point. Halfway through the building process of the pants, I discovered that I had picked the wrong color. So for some reason throughout this whole time of doing the pant, I had the 2000s version of Shaggy stuck in my head and I assumed that his pants were brown. In reality, his pants are actually a reddish brown, so it leans towards burgundy. 
What also tripped me up was in these shots from the 1969 version of Shaggy. So when you look at these shots, the different lighting situations, of course, change the color of his outfit. So in some shots, it looks very brown. In some shots, it looks very burgundy. And that just didn't click in my head. So halfway through the project, I re-dyed the pants this time with a scarlet dye. So if you're looking through the video and wondering why are the pants suddenly like this lovely redwood color, that's why. <laughs> Are you joining me? Hey, bub. So what most people don't realize when it comes to cameras in color, especially color dyeing, what happens is that each camera reads color differently than real life. So I ended up adding a lot more red to the pant just so that the camera that I'm using right now and also my phone could pick up the color well. This is not to say that in real life the color doesn't look good because it does look good in real life and actually looks very much like the character. It's just something that I have always in my mind that I need to sometimes bump up the color just a tad so that the camera can see the color. So without further ado, let's solve the mystery of the Shaggy Rogers costume. So I purchased my fabric off of Fabric Mart and actually they sent me some extra yards which was very kind of them since it was the end of the bolt. So I'm going to cut this at about like one and a quarter, maybe a little bit more than one and a quarter just to be on the safe side. But Olivia is small enough where I think one and a quarter is going to be just fine for her. So the pattern I bought for Shaggy is a 1971 Simplicity pattern and it's of a flare pants. It's two years more than my target 1969 date, but I think it's perfect for what I'm trying to do. Only issue is that I do have to work around this knee detail because the pattern is in two pieces instead of one. The other issue is that this pattern is about three sizes bigger than Olivia, so it would fit my body, but not Olivia, so I have to size it down a lot, which is part of the point of why I'm even doing Scooby-Doo because I do want to learn about sizing down patterns and fitting body types that are different than myself. So in the process of sizing down this pattern, I'm first taking it all down the way it is already onto some of my paper. And to do that, I have to attach the pieces. And I have to go back in and read in the instructions because I'm finding a hard time where exactly they matched up the bottom of the pant to the top of the pant because one of the things that's a little bit strange to me is how thick these lines are on the pattern. I mean, look at that. That's like a, a, a whole eighth of an inch that they made this line thick and that in itself can throw off any measurement I take from it. Yeah, it's literally one eighth. And my other issue is that when I match up the dots like it says to, so let's put the dot on top of each other. If you look at the edges, the pattern does not line up. So the lines right here and the lines right here. And I don't know if that's because of the way it's supposed to be cut where it kind of stretches with it. So when you cut the fabric, there's some bias there. So maybe the bias of the fabric stretches with it so you can sew it properly. But now I'm just having the issue of how do I connect this on the pattern and keep it straight. So that's gonna be the thing I'm doing right now. I'm trying to keep this straight. Here we have the corduroy that we dyed for the shaggy pants. Oh, there's my interfacing. And I'm gonna go ahead and start cutting out the new uh, pieces for the shaggy pants. And now I'm going to double check to make sure that this is the right length for Olivia. Her waist to ankle is about 40. 
Okay, so I think this pattern might be long enough for her. So because Shaggy's pants are a little bit baggy, I'm just gonna extend this as far as the fabric will allow me. When I sew this, I'm gonna be sewing from the top down, so anything that's left over and extra will be extended and I can chop it at the bottom. Okay, so this is the color I've determined that I want for the shaggy pants. So I'm gonna go ahead and serge the edges of the corduroy so that it doesn't fray when it gets washed again. Okay, so it has come out of its second dye bath of red, which means these pants have been dyed four times, two times with brown, two times with red, which was uh, dark brown and then scarlet. But now we have this gorgeous color. Like, can we appreciate this right now? It's even better in person. It's just hard to show on camera. It has that red wood feeling. When the light hits it, you can see where those red tones are. Just obviously it's a corduroy, so there are some shadows mixed into it where the texture is coming from. But this is just beautiful. So I've gone ahead and sewn up to the point that the pattern wants me to do, but I'm going to diverge and do a method for the zipper. That's going to give me the same result that the pattern is instructing me, but I'm pretty sure it's going to give me an easier way to install the zipper. And basically what I'm doing is I'm going to put some basting threads down the front of the zipper and then I'll align the zipper and once the zipper is sewn in, unpick those threads up to the stopping point. So the pattern originally wanted me to do 3 eighths away from the zipper teeth and didn't do that all around, which I did, but that left me with the zipper being too obvious that it's there when the fabric stretched, you saw too much green, and that was just not my cup of tea. So to solve this issue, I did a second stitch, which is more of um, an eighth away from the zipper teeth. So there's one that you can't really see, but this is actually two rows of stitching. And because the corduroy is so thick and I chose a matching thread, it's really hardly visible at all that there is double stitching. But at the back, as you can see, you can see where I stitched. And I'm just doing this for fun, having a couple uh, contrasting zippers on the garments because these characters are cartoon characters and I just thought it would be an interesting element if the garments had little nods to other colors that are in their wardrobe. So now I've gone ahead and sewn up the back panels together. So now we have the back of the pant as said by the instructions to do. So, hello. I have just had my fitting with Olivia yesterday and I am very excited because the shirt and the pants are gonna get finished today because um, we actually only have like two days left of Olivia before she goes on her trip. And in order for the uh, characters to come out in the right order in terms of, of every, like every, about every two weeks of them coming out, um, I need to finish her now so that I can see her today in the afternoon and tomorrow in the morning for whatever time we have for photo shoots and maybe some Instagram reel videos. So I'm very excited to get to work and to put everything together because I had the fitting last night and she looked awesome. So one thing I forgot to do, which is lack of my forethought, is when I dyed the pants red, I forgot that I need to dye extra material red for when I do the waistband. On the bright side though, this is a type of waistband that gets tucked inside the pant, so you actually don't see it when you wear the pant. So what I'm doing is I'm making sure to cut down where it's connected to the waistband, and then the side is the actual pant, I'm keeping long, and that helps reduce bulk. And then what also happens is the stitch I'm doing is grabbing that pant seam that's on top. So when it stitches, it goes through the brown onto here, which is securing this onto 
that material. When this pant folds over and an extra sliver of the main fabric goes with it because it's going over a curve. And this creates the front side of the pant to be perfectly smooth and almost vineless when in reality it's not. So with that, the costume is done and it's on to the photo shoot. As you can tell, I had a lot of fun doing this photo shoot. I decided to present the images as if they were being taken with a Polaroid camera. If you notice in the corner of the images, it says 1969. This is a detail I saw in my own family photos and I thought it would be perfect to include around the edges of the Polaroids. So this is a gender bend of Shaggy Rogers. Olivia came up with the perfect name for the character, which is Norma Shaggy Rogers. It was small details like this that made me smile throughout the whole way through the project. And there's like a lot of little nuggets I have everywhere that is just tiny details and no one notices but me. One of these details I wonder if anyone caught is when Shaggy was holding a old DC comic book in the photo shoot. This particular issue that we used is of Batman and it's from 1971. It's one of the oldest ones in my collection and I do happen to have a lot of old comic books from both DC and Marvel. The reason why this is here is because, if you don't remember, in 1972, there is a crossover movie between Scooby-Doo and Batman and Robin. And as this comic book cover says, Batman and dot 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 question mark, I thought it was a very fitting nod to future events that happened in the Scooby-Doo universe. So the reason why you see Krispy Kreme in the beginning of the photo shoot is because I was trying to find a brand of food that still is around that Shaggy most likely would eat. So this brand started in 1937 and actually started opening up stores in Orlando where I am in the 60s. So I thought it was the perfect location to shoot for Shaggy going out to get food. Because as we all know, Shaggy has a very big stomach and is seen eating in almost every single episode there is in Scooby-Doo. I still could not believe that we were halfway through the human cast of the Scooby-Doo gang and I am so excited to show you the rest of the characters and to just go on developing this series. Thank you so much to my friends for sparing their precious time to help me with such a massive undertaking. And also thank you to my grandmother who repeatedly let me use her house for photo shoots. If you feel so inclined, please like and subscribe and I'll be seeing you in the next video. Hey, it's me. Now, there's something I actually wanted to share. It just didn't fit in the other part of the research. And that is, I found out something really interesting. Jaggy has a decorative belt buckle collection. I found this out in the VHS tape release of Scooby-Doo's Greatest Mysteries from 1998. I have the largest collection of decorator belt buckles in the world. 653 the last count. I I'm wearing my favorite one right now. Like it's hard to catch, but I wear a different buckle for every mystery. You just gotta pay attention. When Olivia and I found that out while watching clips of Scooby-Doo to figure out different uh, voice impressions, that one just like made us start laughing like crazy. Hello, Shaggy. <laughs> Hello! With your glasses. Shaggy so, nerdcore. Anyway. Nerdcore? 
Just kidding. <laughs> my glasses are legitimately fogging. Why aren't mine? I don't understand. I don't know. This Maybe. This is the second time. <laughs> What you got there, Shaggy? Donuts. Two dozen. Well, minus one that I ate. <laughs>